Crime overall is falling nationwide, but the numbers on the most serious crime, homicide, show Chicago's cases are not declining as quickly as the two largest cities in the nation, New York and L.A. Just why does Chicago lag behind the nation's two largest cities in homicide numbers, and what can the city learn from them? Joining us are Andrew Papa Christos, professor of sociology at Northwestern University, and Caitlin Devaney, who is on the faculty in criminology at DePaul University. And joining us via Zoom are Jim McDonald, the former sheriff of Los Angeles County and now director of the University of Southern California's Safe Communities Institute, and Jillian Snyder, a retired New York City police officer, adjunct lecturer at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York, and policy director of criminal justice and civil liberties at the think tank R Street Institute in Washington, D.C. We thank you all. Uh, for being here, and I've been wanting to look at this question for so long because I think this is sort of under examined in the media. Comparing Chicago to New York and LA, if we can show that graphic uh, looking at uh, homicide numbers in 1990, Chicago 849, New York City more than 2,200, Los Angeles nearly 1,000. Look at how far New York City and Los Angeles dropped. Chicago dropped, but not nearly uh, as much. Kaylin Devaney, is there any? Is there any easy explanation for that? Yeah, well, for, well first off, so this is a sh number of sheer homicides um, and the count. So what we like to do in criminology and what I think is a better analysis is to ground it in population. So when we do that, now Chicago is still much above the rest, but we'd like to put them in the, a category with cities the same population. Well, clearly the rates were similar in the 90s, and it seems like the rates in New York and L.A. went down much, much greater than Chicago. Yes, it's true. We, we out of all the large cities, we have the highest um, homicide per 100,000 people. L.A. and New York, New York has always done it much better than us. They've always been pretty low. Um, we stand out with that, and I think when we look at why, we look at a... a historical policies of social isolation, of racial discrimination, of concentrated poverty that speak to numbers that have, historic, have historically been higher than New York and Los Angeles. Jillian Snyder, you were, of course, in the NYPD. What do you think the difference is between uh, your city and what you were able to accomplish there and, and what, what's going on in Chicago? I do want to just point out that Chicago is trending downward, so that is something that we should be looking at and applauding. Um, their numbers to, to date, as of last week, did go down. But looking at the NYPD compared to Chicago, um, we were really fortunate that we had Police Commissioner Bratton come on in the 90s and implement some of the most novel um, initiatives that policing had seen at that time. Broken Windows methodology came out. We started really focusing on lower level offenses, quality of life offenses, because the point is not to over arrest, but instead to really put forth the collective efficacy that gives neighborhoods the, the reason that they want to keep their communities safe. And I think that NYPD was pivotal in that movement. Jim McDonald, what about Los Angeles? Uh, a very large drop if you look at the long term compared to Chicago. What, what went right there? You know, I look at uh, where we were in Los Angeles back in 93, where we had just under 1,100 murders, I believe, and we finished up 2019 with 252 murders. That's about an 80% decrease in, uh, in homicides in just one city, and yet nobody was talking about that. We should have built on the great foundation we had and continued in the right direction. And what we've seen uh, since that time, post-2020 in particular, uh, has been uh, crime going in the wrong direction for reasons that were predictable. I think when you look at uh, comparing cities for, for homicide, for violent crime, and for other crime, there's it's a nuanced situation, and I think there's a tendency to use it as a soundbite. But when you look at the police and what they've done, uh, success or, or not so much, uh, police are just one part of the overall equation. You've got prosecutors, you've got uh, the judicial system, you have uh, the political climate that you all operate in, what's enforced, what's not enforced, what's okay today, what that wasn't uh, uh, before, and, and vice versa. So you, you operate in an ecosystem and you do the best you can with what you have, but at the end of the day, if the police don't have the support of the public and don't get a fair shake in their mind from the media, uh, the lack of engagement that you'll see is something that uh, is fairly predictable. And we've seen that post-2020 in, in certain cities across America. Andrew Papakristos, uh, the part of the uh, ecosystem is the socioeconomic uh, status of these cities. Chicago's a very different city than L.A. and New York. Does that play into the difference here? It plays very much into this difference. I mean, so in addition to some of the things I've already been pointing out around the criminal justice actions that happen in these spaces, New York as a city 
gentrified large parts of New York, massive parts of Manhattan. When we think about what Brooklyn and the Bronx looked like in the 1990s, even, and we look there today, it's changed. It's still very segregated, but it's not as segregated as Chicago. And it, it, other changes that happened in Los Angeles, in addition to changing sort of income stats, they were under a consent decree and changed a lot of the things that cities like Chicago are only doing right now. And we talked about the police efforts. The other thing that Los Angeles did very, very well 15, 20 years ago was bringing together sort of domains of public safety, right? So they had an office, the grid office, which looked at bringing together, say, street outreach, law enforcement, and really coordinating things in much different ways that you're only seeing now in cities like, like Chicago. And one final thing we can't not say is that gangs in New York were never sort of as institutionalized as L.A. or Chicago. For stuff that they did in the 60s and 70s, they have, they have gangs, they have crews, but what Chicago and L.A. looked like in the 90s was very different. New York is the weird one here when you look at the, how they became safe. They're very, very unique, um, and they had a lot of things going on at one time. Too. Kaylin Devaney, are there lessons here that Chicago can take from uh, New York or L.A. and, and, and apply it to the police department, to the to community organizations, or to the general political environment here? I think just generally when I look at the history of policies in New York, they created housing policies in which they didn't put effort into concentrated poverty, racialized poverty, in the way that we have. We have housing pol policies that took... Uh, that created housing in one area, it became concentrated, and then we moved out from there. New York didn't do it in the same, the same way. So when we take lessons, it's how do we treat communities from a holistic way, then that becomes anti-violence. How do we treat them in terms of policy, um, health care, food, uh, all of these policies that holistically are anti-violence approaches. You know, Jillian Snyder, when we talk about Chicago and national media, kind of gets uh, tagged with being uh, the murder capital of the United States, but it's pretty erroneous because when you look at per capita, as we've talked about, it usually doesn't even crack the top 10. Uh, so, so in terms of per capita rate, Chicago is not as violent as maybe some portrayals of it are. No, you're absolutely correct. There's actually, the most recent studies have shown that Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Chattanooga, Dallas, Nashville, Memphis, those cities, if you're looking at it and you are controlling for population density, Chicago is lower than all of them in terms of violent crime and homicide rate. And Jim McDonald, is there a difference in terms of how all the cities are reporting these numbers? I know there's a new uh, sort of system put in place by the FBI in, in recent years. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the FBI in 2021 uh, had asked that everybody be on board. It's a voluntary system. Everybody wants to comply with it. It's the National Incident uh, Reporting the NIBRS, the National Incident Based Reporting System, uh, to replace the Uniform Crime Reports, which go back almost 100 years. Uh, NIBRS uh, would be more inclusive of crimes. It would uh, count all crimes, not just the the primary crime in a particular incident. It can, it can uh, address as many as 10 crimes in, in capturing the data on that. The challenge is it's much more labor intensive to be able to input the data necessary to be able to get the results you want to get and get that granular level of detail. Uh, and what we've seen in the, in, you know, prior to 2021 when it was supposed to be completed and everybody be on board, we didn't see that. We saw about 60% or so of the departments on board so that you had two different criteria being used to be able to crap, capture crime data. Uh, the problem was, and it wasn't that people didn't want to be on board, it was resources. Uh, recruitment and retention became a big issue post-2020, uh, both on the professional side of the house and the sworn side. And so there was a hesitance there to be able to pull people off the street in some cases to be able to get this job done. And it didn't become a, a priority of that nature. We still have the issues with recruitment and retention as we move forward. So challenges just in the logistics of being able to get that done, but we're moving in the right direction. And Andrew Papakristos, we talked about how uh, pretty much most cities have seen a, a drop in homicides since the spike in the pandemic year. Uh, is that something to, to, that Chicago can hang its hat on, or is it just kind of just happening irregardless of policy? No, I think Chicago's put a lot of effort into sort of, actually, Chicago started putting a lot of effort in 2016, even before the pandemic, in its community violence infrastructure. And in fact, those dividends, I think, paid off during COVID. And one of our, you know, part of our team's analysis showed, you know, that we have a set of organizations that have contributed that rates would have been much higher had they not been in place. So it's hard to imagine a world without COVID. We can't do that. There'll always be a little asterisk. But what we know is if some of these things weren't in place, there would have been more homicides. Yeah, there would have been more shootings. And going around uh, during COVID, I went to reporting in each of the neighborhoods to see how many community organizations yeah. are there and active. No doubt that they make a difference in terms of putting a dent in, the, in those numbers. Uh, we could talk about this all show, but we have to leave it there. My thanks to 
uh, Jim McDonald uh, from L.A., Jillian Snyder in New York, and then here in Chicago, Caitlin Devaney at DePaul and Andrew Papachristos from Northwestern. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks.